welcome to the Living History UK Festival. What you see before you is the 400 years of the British soldier, going from the English Civil War all the way up to the modern day. I now hand you over to Steve Davis. Thanks, Pete. So, we're going to start, of course, here on the right-hand side. The reason we're going to start here is because before 1645, Britain, and specifically England, did not have a full-time standing army. They did have, however, what's called a trained band, local militia, if you will, part-time soldiers, retainers of medieval times, let's say. However, when the Civil War broke out in 1642, by 1644, things were not going too well for Parliament. The Royalists were beginning to gain the upper hand. Something had to give. And what gave was that Parliament decided to create its own full-time professional standard army, which trained, equipped and armed almost unilaterally in the same uniform. So starting with that new model army of 1645, which would go on to win the Battle of Naseby and eventually uh, the British Civil Wars of a ho as a whole, we have two main arms that were in use, two types of soldiers, starting with the pikemen. It might look like a huge cocktail stick, but it's incredibly useful. Excellent. So, this is what we're going to term as the defensive arm of the army. So, cavalry were on the battlefield, of course, at this point. We'll talk about it shortly, but the musketeer doesn't have a bayonet at this point in time. He can't defend himself against horse. However, horses do not like a big point of thing. Go towards it, it will hurt. It's simple. Horses are not that stupid. Humans might be. So, as well as the pike being a defensive arm, he's also armed with his breastplate and his crook or hanger. So that's a short sword, very cheaply made, very effective. So when the infantry close, as they did, you have that weapon, the pike becomes redundant, you switch to the tuck. He also goes back and breastplate, his armour. He's on campaign, so he's carrying a blanket with him, of course for the night, and he's got his snapsack with his uh, bits and bobs and his personal uh, effects, if you will. What's important about this soldier is this is where we see the first real uh, term of the red coat. So you will see the red coat dominates the first part of the lineup. There's this huge um, sort of understanding, let's say, that the, the British soldier at this point, the red coat, uh, was, was given a red coat because it was the cheapest cloth that was available. It's as simple as that. It's not because you could see them clear on a battlefield, that was a bonus, and it wasn't because it, it hides blood if the soldier is wounded. This cloth is the cheapest cloth that was available, and cloth was hard to come by because you had two factions, if you will, fighting over the same cloth. And that is what was available. And that is the pikeman of 1645, the Battle of Naseby. The second uh, soldier we have of the new model army is the musketeer, the offensive arm. So, armed with a matchlock musket, maximum of two uh, shots a minute for a well-trained and drilled soldier, which from the new model army being a professional army, two shots a minute is good going. So you'll see a piece of uh, cord. So that's what's called slow match. On the end, we've got burning embers. It burns very slow, hence the name. When the pan's opened, it drops into the pan and ignites the gunpowder, which hopefully sets off the charge inside the barrel. Now, loading the musket, we didn't have cartridges uh, widespread use at this point. We have what's called, uh, more modernly, a bandolier or a collar of boxes or chargers, little wooden bottles with the gunpowder pre-measured inside. And that's how you would charge uh, the musket with powder and then going into a little pouch on the uh, bandolier, take your shot out, goes down the barrel, run the lock home. And once you've faffed around with that, you can uh, get your match cord, set it in place and hopefully it goes bang. 
There was also the flint lock and the wheel lock at this point, but they were not widespread and they were incredibly expensive as well in relation to the match lock. Again, red coat, uh, no helmet or armour. Uh, these are the offensive arms, that's the defensive arm. Thank you very much. Right, we're going to move forward in time now, around 60 years into the future from the British Civil Wars, and we're going to have a look at a soldier as it would have been at the Battle of Blenheim. So if anyone's ever been to Blenheim Palace, wonder where it got its name from, it's the Battle of Blenheim. So John Churchill resided at Blenheim Palace after the battle. So he was given a huge wave of money to live there and it was built in his honour for winning a great victory. So in 60 years, we've gone from two arms, a defensive and an offensive, to just the one soldier. So again, it's a black powder musket. We've moved on from matchlocks. We've uh, cracked the nut and they're now issued with flint locks. So that is a piece of flint hitting uh, a piece of metal and dropping a shower of sparks into the pan rather than dropping a, a, a piece of burning cord. Also, there is uh, a bayonet. So the bayonet hadn't been invented for widespread use during the English Civil War. So rather than having a huge pike and then having a musketeer as well, if horse are on the battlefield, the bayonet goes on, that becomes your pike, your defender gets cavalry, but you can also fire your musket as well. He's equipped for full marching order, with his snap sack on the back, with his canteen, haversack, and then his cartridge pouch there. So rather than having uh, these wooden bottles with your black powder in, we've moved on to cartridges. So if anyone's ever put cartridge paper in the printer, that's where it comes from. It's paper that's made up to make cartridges, and that's what it was primarily used for. He's also got uh, a sword as well. Um, semi-redundant at this point with the advent of the bayonet but still has its use on the battlefield. Again the red coat is retained um, and this is what's going to see us through uh, up to and including and beyond in fact the Crimean War uh, but we'll come on to that shortly. Um, that is a soldier of the Battle of Blenheim so we're looking at the very early 1700s there. Thank you very much. So up next for your viewing pleasure, we have uh, a British soldier of Courtney's Regiment during the uh, Jacobite Rebellion, so 1740s. Um, huge battle at Culloden, let's put it that way, not taking any sides. But this is what a British soldier looked like at that point. So again, near enough looking has changed, he looks essentially the same. The tactics are pretty much the same. He's using a flint lock black powder musket, bayonet on the end, got his tricorn on the top, he's got his red coat, you see, got the yellow facing colours on the uh, cuffs, on the turnbacks, that denotes a county uh, regiment at this point in time. Rather than having the numbering system of regiments um, like we kind of know of now, uh, we have the, the regiment named after their, uh, their colonel. So, uh, so Portney's Regiment, which would be the 13th, if I'm uh, correct. Yes, sir. excellent. So 13th Regiment of Foot. So he's got his uh, canteen, bayonet, short sword as well, and his cartridge pouch on his right hip with his cartridges, uh, spare flints and so forth. Gladstone Soldier of 1745, Battle of Culloden. We move forward very slightly, so only 10 years essentially forward in time. And we're going to look at a grenadier of Lampton's regiment. So Lampton's will go on to become the 68th Durham Light Infantry. In the 1750s, 1760s, this is the soldier you would have been up against in the uh, sort of uh, French Indian Wars, that kind of period. So you can see he's got a hat that's completely different to the two soldiers before him. That's because he's a grenadier. So he's the strongest and the tallest, well, one of the strongest, one of the <coughs> tallest soldiers in. Uh, the regiment. He is called a grenadier because he carries grenades. So these had a really efficient use on the battlefield at this point. The grenadiers would get nice and close, they would sling their musket over the top and wearing the mitre as opposed to a tricorn, that hat wouldn't get in the way. So it has a functional use as well. Those grenades would be lobbed at close quarters 
into the packed ranks of enemy infantry and caused absolute carnage. You've seen the cartoons and, and sort of children's films where a grenade is thrown onto the deck of a ship and they put the fuse out with their hands. That's exactly the same grenade. Aside from that, flintlock, muzzle loading uh, musket, bayonet is exactly the same, red coat, not really much has changed at all. He's carrying his knapsack on his back, his canteen of course, have a sack with his day's rationing and so forth. And uh, you can see the nice turn back screen for, uh, for uh, Lampton's regiment of course, uh, which will become of course the 68. So there we go. It's actually soldier of the 1750s. And you can see the drill professionally performed there. It's a nice slow pace, inspired by the Prussians. Very methodical drill. Now, next up, keeping with the theme of the Americas, we're going to go into the 1770s. So, the soldier of the 33rd Regiment. So, a lot had changed by this point. The British had been roughly handled in the Americas during the period before, and we have something called light infantry beginning to be developed and used. Those tactics were starting to uh, really form at this moment in time. Musket. Exactly the same, flintlock, black powder, musket. The drills, near enough the same. A few things have been tweaked and changed, however. The uniform slightly shorter in the tails, more practical. Carrying his bayonet, haversack with his day's ration, camp kettle as well. So that's for uh, every sort of one, four, one in six guys to carry the camp kettle to keep uh, those guys moving in the field and fed and watered. He's got his pack. So going for a bit more of a rectangular kind of backpack now, as opposed to a kind of like sausage roll, if you will. Uh, have a sack under here, cartridge pouch on his right hip, with his cartridges, and uh, his flints in as well. And of course, his uh, bayonet. And uh, excellent. So that is your soldier of the American Revolutionary Wars, Wars of Independence, depending on which side of the fence you sit. We won't talk about the result of it. Thank you very much. <coughs> We're going to transport uh, 40 years into the future from the 1770s. Battle of Waterloo. I'm sure we've all heard of the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, one of the most important battles in modern history, let's say. This is a, a soldier, a private, a guardsman even. Coldstream Guards. So Coldstream Guards were Hoogerman at Waterloo. Now, a lot has changed. So the army is beginning to learn from uh, its mistakes, from its defeats, and even from its victories uh, in the 18th century. The uniform is more practical. So he's wearing grey overalls. So in 1815, troops are in grey overalls. They're not tight fitting anymore. They're a practical garment, as opposed to in the peninsula, they're wearing bright white trousers or pantaloons to start with. Not very practical, especially when it gets dirty. The coat is a lot shorter, it's higher waisted, it's more practical. But he's armed with a slightly slimmed down musket, the India pattern musket. Essentially just a shorter barrel uh, than his predecessor. Uh, but it's a flintlock black powder musket. Uh, looking for up to three rounds a minute optimal uh, from that. But he's got his bayonet. Nothing's changed in that respect. He's also changed his hat style. So he's gone for a regimental cap. Uh, so fashion really starts dominating the battlefield now in the Napoleonic Georgian era. So the hats have become a little bit more pomp and pipe play, let's say. But he's carrying all his kit, he's in full marching order. He's got his knapsack on his back with his grey coat on the top. Uh, he's in dress uniform. Have a sack with your day's rationing, canteen, bayonets there, and then cartridge pouch on his right hip as well. It's actually Guardsman of Waterloo, 1815. We talked about the development of light infantry as a result of what was going on in the Americas in the 18th century and that style of warfare. By 1815, the British had really, really cracked them up. They started copying what the Germans were doing, which was having Jaegers and riflemen in their ranks. I'm going to do it again, I said it yesterday, and I beat myself every time I say it. We've all watched Sharp on the TV. It's a fantastic series. 
the 95th Rifles. That was the regiment you'd have seen on the television. The 95th Rifles, first rifle regiment in the British Army. These guys were present at Waterloo and all the way through the Peninsula War. They were at Copenhagen as well. They went to many of uh, endeavours. This was uh, Britain's first real attempt at uh, a camouflage uniform, moving away from the red coat, which would, this would set us on the trajectory to uh, essentially moving into Carcassonne. A huge other development has taken place. So rather than the smooth bore musket that we see all these guys have from 1645 through to and including 1815 and beyond, a huge advent is a rifle. So a rifle is a barrel with grooves in it that spins uh, the projectile. So if you ever watch someone throw a rugby ball, they don't just get the ball and throw it like that. They spin the ball, it's much more accurate. The barrel of a baker will spin the ball, gives you much more better accuracy. So whereas these guys are looking at around 75, 80, 80 yards distance for a semi-accurate shot with their smooth barrels, these guys are anywhere up to and including 350 yards plus. They're highly effective. Their tactics have also changed. They're looking for officers, they're looking for drummers, they're taking out the chain of command. That's what their role is on the battlefield. That's Britain's first real attempt at, uh, at snipers, essentially, professional marksmen and infantry. This is where it all began. Rather than having a traditional uh, sort of socket bayonet like we've seen on the guys before, you see a sword bayonet. So if you've ever seen a, a rifleman or know a rifleman or even been in the rifles yourself and you call uh, your sword bayonet a bayonet, they will say, no, it's a sword. And this is where it stems from. So the, I'll just borrow uh, a So we will see that the, uh, the reach is near enough the same. This is a much earlier musket. The India pattern is a little bit shorter, but the distance for charging against horse is exactly the same. So with the shorter barrel of the rifle, it's made up with the longer sword. <coughs> of course, rifleman carries pretty much all the same kit as a regular infantryman with a knapsack, cartridge pouch. Rather than having pipe plate belts, He's got black, uh, black balled belts, that's a tongue twister. <laughs> so instead of having your white cross belts as a target, you've got your black uh, belts instead. Uh, you've got your canteen, haversack, cartridge pouch too, and uh, a much more functional uh, uniform also. The final one from me before I hand you over to uh, Pete is a rifleman. So this is uh, 40 years in the future from the previous rifleman of the Crimean War, from the Rifle Brigade. So you can see the uniform's pretty much the same. It's green and black, but it's a bit more functional in the sense that he's, you can see he's got his trousers turned up at the bottom. We've moved away from gaiters. Um, you can see his rifle's changed. So this is, uh, again, a slightly longer rifle, um, nice Enfield rifle, but the percussion cap has been introduced at this point. So rather than a flint lock, showering those sparks into the pan, this is where you start seeing the evolution of a percussion cap. So it's much more functional, much more user friendly, and much more reliable on the battlefield. Things are really starting to modernize and change. Uh, we'll have seen Crimea in the news over the past 10 years or so. We all know where Crimea is now. The British were there in the 1850s. Not many people know it, it's a forgotten part of history. But, like the soldiers before him, he's got his canteen here, haversack, he's got his cartridges in his pouch. The principle is the same. Things do slightly change at this point. And you can see he's got his grey coat on his back as well, being carried there. Thank you very much. And that is it from me. I'm gonna hand you on to Pete, who's gonna take you into the First World War and beyond. So we're now moving forward about 50 years now, just over 50 years, to the First World War. This is the British soldier of 1914. He is one of the most technologically advanced soldiers that we've ever sent to war. 
makers. He's one of the only countries in Europe that is using canvas webbing equipment. Everyone else is using leather. We're not. We've got a decent camouflage uniform. And we've also got the SMLE, the short magazine, Lee Enfield. The chamber's 10 rounds, where the other rifles in Europe are only chambering five. Also, the bolt is the only rifle in the European armies that are using a curved bolt, not a straight bolt as well, which makes it a lot easier to follow your target to carry on shooting the man. He has his uh, cap, his service dress cap. There's no helmets at this time. So he's just wearing his, red, his soft cap to go into war. So imagine head injuries when they start getting entrenched are quite high. You notice he's got an uh, unregulation kit, he's got a scarf on, so he is sort of November time of 1914, where they haven't quite started entrenching yet. We're still working on a mobile war. So we're ditching the closing months of that mobile, of, of that mobile war. Um, where are we going for this now? <laughs> turn around, turn around. So, on his back, he has his large pack in there with his great coat. He might be able to squeeze a blanket in there if it's enough room. Spare shirt, underwear, socks, and then on the side to me. On the side, he has his mess tins. The mess tins haven't changed shape for a good hundred years, so we're still retaining this D-shaped mess tin. He also has his haversack on the side where he'll keep his rations. Later on, they'll start putting personal items in there. So it works very much in the same way as what the previous generations were doing with the small bags on their side. Uh, what are we going, Jen Fun? Yeah. What else we got? That is it for 1914. Okay, we're not. 14. 1916. <coughs> Here's our soldier of 1916, so we've moved forward a couple of years now and he's starting to look very different, but only in a slight way. We've got, so what we've got now, we have leather equipment, but why have we been the most technologically advanced army in Europe by having canvas web equipment, but going back to leather? Well, the problem was with the influx of volunteers, we couldn't keep up with the production. So they came up with the 1914 pattern webbing equipment because leather is, was still very much used in day-to-day -day life. So there was a lot of saddlers and people like that who could make this stuff. Originally, it was only supposed to be used for the men on the home service while they were doing their training. However, because of supply and demand, blokes ended up going over, over, overseas wearing the 1914 leather equipment. And you will see that still being worn in 1918 as well. Most importantly, he now has a helmet. So this comes in very late 1915. So as you can imagine, the casualty rate for head wounds goes down quite dramatically because he now has a helmet. On his side, on his side, he has this little bag. Now in there is his anti-gas equipment. He has a PH hood inside. So we're now getting into gas warfare. So most commonly, you'll see a lot of the Kitchener volunteers wearing his leather equipment. So how you see this man stood here now is very much how they looked on the first day at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. He also has a bandolier as well because he's going in on the assault. So obviously he doesn't know if he's going to be supplied or if the supply is going to get up to him for ammunition. So he's got his ammunition in his pouches, plus he'll carry as many bandoliers as he's able to to get to that first point. Thank you, 1916. 1970.
We moved in to 1917-18, so we're now in the latter stages of the war. So we've now been fighting this trench war for about four years now, and we've learned a lot from it. So what we've got now, we've still got our helmets, but we've now got a machine gun. All right? So we had Vickers machine guns as support weapons, but this is the first platoon support weapon where it's carried within the infantry platoon. Big gun, yeah. In 1916, you'd have one per platoon, but by 1918, there's going to be two per platoon. And as they're moving across no man's land, the idea was the Lewis gun teams would flank the platoon as they're moving across. On his front, he has a service box respirator. This is what we perceive now as a gas mask. So it has a filter, a tube and a face piece. That comes in very, very late 1916 and then you'll see it in 1917 for Passchendaele and the 100 day offensive. But this is the early stages of the introduction of this respirator because he still has on his side, turn to your right, he still has his bag for his PH hood. Go back to front. The reason for that was, is they knew the PH was a sound item. So it, it was effective. Although it was very basic in its construction, it did save lives. When this came in, the lads on the front line weren't really too sure about it. So they'd rather keep that as a backup just in case this didn't work. But once they knew this was a very good piece of equipment, you then start to see them getting rid of the PH hoods. As he is a Lewis gunner, he's also got a sidearm as well. He has his Webley revolver. And we move on to number two. This is the man's number, this is the gunner's number two. So he helps the gunner in the firing of the gun. So he's armed with his SMLE, like any other infantryman. <laughs> Port, fine. His box respirator, he has his canvas webbing equipment on, but added. Take you off, there you go. Go in. Yeah, there we go. On the side, he has these circular pouches. These circular pouches are the magazines for the Lewis gun. So when he runs out of ammunition, he will take the magazine off the gun and he will replace it and the gunner will keep on firing. Uh, turn around. Turn around. There we go. So he's moved his haversack. So in 1914 our haversack was down by our side. We're now moving it to the back because the large packs are left in trench stores for when they're actually needed. So he's now got his back and he's got all the necessary items that he needs to survive on the front line. And also, going into the assault, you don't want to be carrying a large pack with you. Because they learned that from 1914, running around, running around with your large pack on ain't a good idea. He's also got a shovel as well. So when they get onto that first point, so when they take that first line of enemy trenches, they can start work on constructing the parapet. Because the parapet at the front is our opposites. So they need to knock down the back parapet so they can shoot at the second trench that the Germans are holding. So they need to start working on that, turn around. And there we go. So that is the British soldier of the First World War. Right, here we go. Come on down. Now we're moving 25 years into the future to the Second World War. The look of the British infantrymen from 1939 to 45 is very, very similar with only small quirks to the change of his kit. These two men are from 1944, so this is how a man would look when they're storming the Normandy beaches. He has his brain gun, which is also the replacement for the Lewis gun. So there's one in each section, so they rely very heavily on the firepower of the Bren. So instead of it being two light support weapons per platoon, you've got one in every section. So you've now got three per platoon. He's got his toolkit, 
uh, on his front there, which will help him adjust gas parts and to strip the weapon down. He's also got his gas mask on the left, if you want to turn to that side. So this is his assault respirator. Because when they hit the Normandy beaches, the threat of gas is still a very real thing, although it wasn't used on soldiers. But it was still a very much a fear factor. Uh, turn around, face that way. Yeah, there we go. On his back, he has a small pack, which is very much like the haversack they were using in the First World War, just that it's now bigger and contains more items like mess tins, wash kit, and things like that. Underneath, he has this like, what looks like green tarpaulin. That's his gas cape. Now that's a cape, that's a, basically a long rain mac, in effect. Now what that is, is his anti-gas equipment. So this is really an early form of an MBC suit. But they were very good raincoats. So you'll see a lot of blokes still using them and just using them as rain mats. Right, we soldier number two. Again, like the First World War, the gunner needs his number two. So his number two has his spare magazines. So he'll have two of those. It also might carry, he's also got a bandolier as well. So once those magazines are empty, he can hand fill them while the gun's still in operation. Then on his back, his extra piece of kit, that's the spare barrel for the gun. So after excessive firing, the barrel is going to get hot and they'll need to change the barrel. So all that equipment to do the barrel change is all contained in there. Also, his rifle has changed. He now has the number four rifle. It's still, in effect, an SMLE. The only difference is the muzzle is different and there's been other measures taken to make less machined parts to make the rifle. Although you will see the SMLE and the number four working side by side. This came to service around 1941. So you'll see all the blokes in Normandy will be using a number four. But when you're looking at places like Italy and Burma, you're going to see a lot of SMLEs because they're just sending all the old stuff over to them. Thank you, Lord Walter. Oh, Norman, good sorry. Just before those two men stormed the Normandy beaches, a few weeks before the Normandy landings, there is a particular sort of soldier that was already operating in France. This is a member of the SAS in the early days of the Normandy campaign. So this is, we're looking at Week, literally weeks before those landings take place and his job <coughs> is to do as much destruction to the enemy supply chain as possible and just be a complete nuisance to the enemy. Blowing up railway lines, um, ambushing convoys, loads of stuff like that. All round with jeeps and machine guns, loads of wrestled with machine guns. So he wears a maroon berry. Obviously we more associate yesterday as today wearing a khaki berry, a sand berry. They did to start off with, but by 1944 they came under the command of the Army Air Corps and then they come under airborne forces, so they had to then go to a maroon barrack. He wears a denison smock, the same as what a paratrooper would wear. He's also got his trousers parachutist, which are specially designed for a paratrooper. And he's also got a very special boot. He is wearing ammo boots, which is a standard army boot. However, he hasn't got hobnails on the bottom. They're actually rubber soled and they're gripped. So he can move around without worrying about slipping. And also he's got better grip for going up rugged terrain. The weapon he's got isn't a British one. So this is a folding stock M1 carbine. Okay, it's an American weapon. But the SAS really, really like them because they've got a 15 round magazine capacity and it's automatic. And also it does pack a punch in the distances that they are going to be firing at. So if they're using number fours, there's no point in them using um, uh, Enfields because that's not the job they're doing. 
they're literally jumping in and out of vehicles and the contacts, if they do get into a contact, is at very close quarters as well. So it's a very, very handy weapon for them to have. He's got his Bergen on his back. This is the Commando Bergen. This has got everything that he needs during his operation. He may have other bags as well, such as a, an American Musette bag as well to add more stuff. But this is what he'll be have. This is what he'll be using while on the operation. They'll just leave him in the vehicles. But as we know, there'll be other jobs he needs to do. Like he might have to go and make an observation post. He might have to go and watch the Germans for a couple of days. So he'll need to go off with his kit and sit in that position for maybe a week or so, and then we'll go back to their harbour area to report what he's said. That way. That's it, that's it, that's it. Also, another thing that they all carried was a pistol as well, just as a secondary weapon. So usually what you'd find is the SS trooper would either have a Browning high power or a Colt 45 like our trooper has here. The Colt 45 was more popular because obviously it was a more powerful round. So it was all down to the user and what he preferred. If he wanted stopping power or he wanted magazine capacity. Thank you very much. So that is the SAS Trooper in 1944. We're now in the closing months of the Second World War. This is 1945. A little bit different to our men. A year previously, in 1944, storming the Normandy beaches. But what he's carrying is, in fact, is exactly the same as what they were. The only difference we're getting now are these smocks. These are windproof smocks. They are being issued in very, very small numbers. So if you've got one, you're lucky. <laughs> but they're very effective. They come as a set, you've got a jacket and trousers, but usually when you see the photographs of them going into Germany, you'll only see the blokes wearing the actual smock. They didn't really bother with the trousers. The weapon he carries is the Mark III Sten gun. So there was four different versions during the Second World War, five different versions, sorry, and that is Mark III. Made by Hornby, yeah. They were cheap, and easy to make. Um, so this would usually be carried by an NCO, so it'd be a section commander and above, um, but they're very good for close quarter stuff. So you'll sometimes see private soldiers carrying them as well, depending on what the job was they had in hand. Thank you very much, soldier 1945. So that is the British soldier from the First World War to the Second World War. I now hand you over to Danny. Danny, thank you very much. Sirs, Marms, ladies, gents. In 1945, we saw the end of fascism, but we had the rise of communism. The communist state, i.e. Russia, had various satellite states that was wanted to influence. Particularly the British protectorates, as we attended here in Malaya. Now, in 1939, the National Service Act required all men over the age of 18 to serve, and this act didn't end until the late 1960s. The common nickname for these national servicemen in the post-war era was the Virgin Soldiers. And our trooper here is representing British servicemen in Malaya between 1949 and 1961. You can see the kit here is specifically designed for jungle warfare. It is of a light air tech material, so allowed to be breathable, but also allowed to dry quickly. He is armed with a Sten gun, but it is in particular the number five Sten. The reason why he is a section leader, but also he is in the jungle fighting conflict, so it's really tight, close knit contacts, but firepower is urgent. In wartime Mark V Sten also had a foregrip, but it was removed post war due to the nuts tightening when being held and firing. He is wearing the 44 pound webbing equipment, but specifically it is a light order. You are dealing in the humid jungle environment. It needs to be lightweight, but also enough to survive the patrol of several weeks behind the line. Many Malaya veterans I have spoken to have talked about coming back off patrol 
being told to strip off and their kit being burnt because it was that infested, rotten and just generally manky. Metal work had to be kept clean because weapons and magazines would rust up overnight. A horrible environment to work on. You'll see we have gone away thankfully from the horrible hobnail boot and we are now wearing a jungle boot, a light canvas and rubber sole boot. Again, it allows for light nimble work in the jungle, but also it allows uh, to be drained and dried quickly. On his back, he is carrying a machete. Again, we're working in close knit jungle environments. We might need to cut out a helicopter landing area or clear out a zone for patrol. He's wearing a small haversack on his back, which variates slightly for the Second World War version as it has extra pouches on the side. Again, we're trying to move as much away from the waste as possible to allow for river wading. He has a water bottle on his back and finally we've gone away from using enamel water bottles. We're now using a steel water bottle, stainless steel, with a cup. He has a rain cape. On his left hip, he has magazine pouch for his uh, Sten gun, which has been a local manufacturer. Speaking to SAS veterans of the Malaya and Borneo conflicts, these were made out of old canvas beds. They were cut up and sewn by the local tailors. As you can see, here's one ammunition pouch on his side. Again, it's all taking the wet water equipment off his belt and trying to get it high. On his head, he has the bush hat which was fashionably altered during the time. Britain at the time had still an empire and we still had commitment. I don't think there's many people here in the crowd who remember Rhodesia. <laughs> One very, very, very Rhodesia and Dom. <laughs> Rhodesia being a backwater of the empire was getting old equipment and our soldier here representing a soldier of the Nyasaland emergency 1959 to 1960 is wearing equipment that his father and his grandfather would recognize he's wearing the 37 pattern equipment he is armed with the Lee Enfield number no. four rifle the turtle helmet and the respirator of second world war vintage you'll see he has an entrenching tool handle chucked in his belt order. It's a bit strange compared to earlier. That is for public order duties. <laughs> the aim is not to hit yourself, but hit anyone who might be breaking the rules, Ned. If you turn around. You'll see on his back he's got a Second World War vintage water bottle and the bayonet is slightly more offensive looking to his back gone back to a blade rather than a pig sticker. He's also wearing the old hobnail boots and the 37 pattern gaiters. Again, the equipment is second rate. It's not what the regular army's got. It is a, a part of the empire. Can anyone here hazard a guess what Britain's largest and longest operational commitment was? Northern Ireland. 1969 to 2007, British forces were involved in policing duties in Northern Ireland. Operation Banner. Here we have a member of the Argyll and Southern Highlanders representing the late 1970s. He is armed with the right arm of the free world. The L1A1 SLR self-loading rifle, a 762 magazine fed weapon. You may notice that the sling is attached to his hand. Why is it not attached to the front of the weapon as every other ear has got? If you're in a public order situation, you can have that back, Carney. He is wearing a black jacket. At the beginning of the conflict, the British Army hadn't really considered this piece of equipment and an urgent operational requirement was issued and these were purchased from America, who at the time were dealing with the Vietnam War. And speaking to veterans of the Northern Ireland conflict, they found it quite interesting that when their flag jackets turned up, they had peace symbols drawn on them. As an NCO, he has a sidearm, which would be a 9mm Browning, 
He has a water bottle and on his left hip, he has got a respirator, an S6 respirator. This is purely for public order duties where CS gas and tear gas may be used. He is kitted out in the 68 pattern DPM uniform, which was the first mass issue deep mass issue camouflage uniform to the British Army. It is a lined uniform. It's fantastic in the winter, horrible in the summer. He is wearing DMS boots. Now these may look like your Second World War era hobnail boots, but they have a rubber sole. We've learned lessons from our SS Trooper 44 and decided to have a directly moulded sole on his boots. But for some strange reason, the British Army has gone back in time and decides to issue putties out again. The gloves he is wearing are specifically designed for Northern Ireland. They have a padded knuckle. And on his belt, he has a first field dressing. This is a representation of the British Army in Northern Ireland. In 1982, the military junta of Argentina threatened the British sovereignty of the Falkland Islands and South Georgia. A task force was dispatched to the Falkland Islands to retake the islands. What we have here in front of you is a member of the Special Air Service as deployed to the Falklands. By this time in the 1980s, especially with the Special Air Service, it was down to the individual man. There was no regulation that your webbing must be worn X, Y and Z. It was down to the individual and the SCS fosters that interest. The man would make up his own belt kit as he saw operationally fit. He has two magazine pouches. Those particular ones were made in Malaya, so this is an old man from, from the Malaya days of the regiment. On his rear of his belt kit, he has two 44 pound water bottles. Again, this is still known as a bit of an alley bit of kit, the 44 pound water bottle. But the most important pouch on his belt kit is the one in the middle there. That is the E&E &E pouch, or the escape and evasion pouch. In there would be enough to get the man out of trouble and work back. Yes, yes, soldier of the Falklands and today. is still an individual. He does not require to be told what to do. Every man is a warrior. They are working in four-man teams, but they work together. He is armed with the M16 assault rifle. It may surprise you that the SCS were the first to use the M16 before the Americans adopted it as a standard issue rifle. It was used with great success by the regiment in Borneo. Underneath the M16, is an M203 grenade launcher. So it gives the individual section firepower. The kit he is wearing is not of the standard soldier. The smock is a windproof mater gabardine material, which is light and fast drying. His trousers are the 88, no, 68, 68 pound, 68 pound lined, the Falklands is cold, but his boots are a high leg. The problem in the Falklands was many, especially of the Parachute Regiment and the Royal Marines, were wearing, still wearing DMS and putties. This allowed for a lot of foot injuries and trench foot. This is why the British Army went away and went for a high leg boot after the conflict. On his back, he has the SCS Bergen. This is slightly different from the standard issue Bergen because it is of a lightweight material. And under the lid is a 66 Law. Again, these are designed against tanks and armoured vehicles, but in the Falklands, they're specifically good against hardened defensive positions, i.e. machine guns, mortar pits. His kit is not standard. It is down to the individual. That's why he's got a beanie hat on. He's more worried about doing the job than keeping to the ranks. And there we are, the SES soldier of 1982. At the end of the Cold War, 1991, when really the Cold War communism started to fall apart. But we still had the Eastern states have problems and still having communist leading. Britain, being where we are, we want to keep the peace in the world. So places like Kosovo, 
Macedonia, Yugoslavia had peacekeeper elements in. Our trooper here is going out, our soldier here is going out on peacekeeping duties. That is why he is wearing the blue helmet cover of the UN. It brings stability, peace and humanitarian aid to people in need. He is armed with the SA-80 assault rifle, a 30 round 5.56 rifle fitted with a four power sighting unit small arms Trilux or SUSAT. He is wearing body armour, now we're seeing individual body armour with Kevlar plates in the front and, and an internal Kevlar liner. The webbing he is wearing is PLCE. Again, it's down to the individual how he set it up. He would normally have ammunition pouches, food, a cooking pouch, a first aid pouch, all down to the individual. We're now breaking away from this stereotypical, the pamphlet says you must have this. It's now going down to the individual, what he needs to become a fighting resource. He's wearing high leg boots, which we learned lessons from the Falklands. And a windproof and woolly That is all from Britain's UN peacekeeping forces. A date that will live in infamy. Inf infamy. 9 11, September 11, 2001. The events in New York with the Twin Towers led to a new form of problems in the world. Britain and our allies went into Afghanistan. In 2003, we invaded Iraq on the premise of weapons of mass destruction. Our trooper here is wearing the desert disruptive pattern material. This was a great uniform for open desert, but later lessons, especially in the green zone of Helmand and pushing up the Sangin Valley, proved that this desert uniform was not suitable. We went then to a multi-terrain pattern uniform which contained elements of greens and browns. Earlier lessons we'd learnt from back in the peacekeeping days of carrying a body armour which only had a small Kevlar plate have been learnt and we're now using a body armour system called Offspray which involves a large plate on the front and one on the back, underneath his Bergen, covering the entire centre of mass, giving more protection. The liner inside his, Kev his, his Osprey set is also of a greater, higher grade. Side pieces are also put in, so now we've got 360 protection on the man. Instead of having PLCE equipment, he has now got pouches that are attached by molly loops to his Kevlar. So ammunition, grenades, first aid, commander's pouch, etc. You may notice he has got a radio on the front. We've now moved away from the principle that a section will have a radio. Every man will have a radio. Personal role radio, PRR. So every man on the battlefield can communicate. He has also got elements like a GPS unit. No more officers with maps and compasses. We now have GPS, side looms, and a bayonet chucked in. One thing on his arm, a tourniquet. Global war on terrorism has taught new lessons and every man, those of you who do first aid at work and now talk about tourniquets, this is where it's come from. The use of tourniquets with catastrophic bleeds. He has also got a sidearm. At this time he realised the Browning high power was getting a bit old now from the Second World War. So things like the SIG and also the Glock were brought into service. He has a backpack on his back. And that's not for his lunch. What he's carrying in there is ECM, electronic countermeasures. This allows him to put a bubble over the entire patrol to knock out any command initiated IEDs in it and other devices. In a patrol, you'd have several of these with different bands, different colors, different frequencies. Talking about protection, We've also got things like Kevlar issued gloves, ballistic glasses. We're now taking step up as the war develops over the 20 years of new kit being issued. 
He is still armed with the SA-80 of his earlier co colleague, but it is now a newer version with a Daniels Defence Rail system on the front and a deployable bipod and a better ACOG scope. I'll now pass you back to Steve for the roundup. That's all from me. Thank you, Danny. So there we have uh, 308 years of the British soldier. Um, so in a beer tent, in a couple of minutes' time, we have Dickie Townsley talking about the uh, uh, Royal Army Medical Corps and chain of evacuation. So it might be raining here, but it's not in a beer tent. So make your way over there. But before you do, we have a huge round of applause for the living historians, please.